today we are inviting you to participate in a dialogue between two psychoanalysts. Uh, my name is Amira Simcha Alpern. I'm a licensed psychologist and a psychoanalyst. And I'm also the founder of the Potential Space, which is a center for education for psychotherapy. I'm also a faculty in the Suffolk Institute for Psychotherapy and Psychoanalysis and in the Dernig Institute. I have the honor of exchanging the idea today with Dr. Jerry Gargiulo. He's a psychoanalyst and a psychotherapist. Uh, he's the author of two books. One of them is uh, Psych, Self and Soul, Rethinking Psychoanalysis and Spirituality. The second book, which is the recent one, which is a more, it's a biography, it's Broken Father, Broken Sons. Dr. Gajulo is also a former president of the National Psychological Association for Psychoanalysis, what we call NPAP which is in Greenwich Village, Manhattan. And he's also the co-founder of the International Forum for Psychoanalysis. He's a member of the American Psychoanalytic Association. So Jerry, one of the things that I thought will be helpful for us and I think helpful for the public to discuss and maybe to learn and rack our brain around is what, what exactly we're doing. What is psychotherapy? What is psychoanalysis? Why should people even seek psychotherapy? Yes. I get a lot, a lot of these questions from my, right. my patients. Right. What, how, how would you answer? Somebody said, should I go to psychotherapy? What will it give me? What yeah. is it about? What is it? I think every human being, the little incident, uh, you know, I've, I've had, even after an analysis, you're liable to be still haunted by parts of your childhood. And that's okay. I think a person goes to therapy when they're willing and they want to understand themselves. When they want to have a full, I, I frequently say therapy is like a college education of our emotions. That's what therapy is. Person says, well, why do I need to go to college? Well, you don't. You don't have to go to college. But if you want to have a wider appreciation of the world, of science and literature and history, college usually helps. Okay? And it's the same thing. If you want to have a deeper appreciation of yourself and where you came from and of those people around you, Therapy will help you get that. Right? The goal of life is to find out who we are, who we want to become, where we came from, why I do such and such a thing over and over. Why do I have problems with such and such type of person? Why do I go into like periodic fits of anxiety or fits of depression? I wonder why, why do I do that? That doesn't really help me. Okay? Those are the kinds of issues that therapy will help you walk around. Okay? And therapy, gives us a chance, gives us a, therapy gives us a sacred place, like a, a holy place, okay, where we can explore who we are. And that's, that's to be valued. You know, Jerry, many people see the decision to go to therapy or to seek therapy as a defeat. How come I couldn't do it on my own? How come I cannot just go to a friend? A friend will help me. So for them to admit or to seek therapy, they have first to admit some failure. And for them to go to therapy means that there is something is broken in them that Sounds cannot help themselves. That's a product of the society we live in. As if we're all supposed to be healthy, we really are healthy, quote unquote, emotionally healthy. And if you're not, then you have a problem. Whereas I think the premise is wrong. We're not all emotionally healthy. Nobody is emotionally healthy. <laughs> you're saying it only because you're a psychologist. Oh, yes. That's what my patient tells me. Right, right, right. right. Stop yeah. being a psychologist. Stop being a psychologist. <laughs> Stop ma say. making so much of nothing. Yes, yeah, so, so I say, yes, can a good friend help? Absolutely. Can a wonderful wife or a wonderful husband help? No question about it. Can they really deepen us? No question. And, and, and do therapy in, in a broad sense of that term, I don't argue with that at all. But to have a trained person who knows how to listen, who doesn't have a personal investment in the outcome, and that's important. If the therapist can hear you, you will hear yourself. You will hear parts of yourself that were just a distant echo before. And we bring that from a distant echo right in front of you. But you're saying something important, I think, that I 
don't want to, I want to highlight you're saying that it's not about acting, it's about reflecting. That's right. And putting it into words and understanding it. That's right. So what's the difference between therapy and psychoanalysis? Just therapy and psychoanalysis? Therapy and psychoanalysis. Well, in psychoanalysis, I'm not, I don't tell people what to do. Okay? Uh, my goal is to help them find out what they want to do. Okay? If I ever, if it's a situation where I may have to say something, make a declarative sentence, Eventually, we're going to find out why I had to make a declarative sentence and tell them something that they should have known. So that even if a therapist says, perhaps you should do X, Y, or Z, if it's an analytic therapy, they're going to find out why did you, why was it necessary for me since you have the same resources I have. So our goal is not to be gurus or teachers. Uh, and I'm not knocking that. That's a different mode of being with other people. That's fine. Our goal is to help the individual understand what they're bringing to their relationships, to themselves, relationships to themselves and to others, that is interfering with a better realization of what it means to be alive, to be real, to be loving, and to be playful. That's my goal. Because you do not have a personal investment in what they do, I can't stress that enough, you can stand outside a bit. You're emotionally present to them. But the goal is personal responsibility. Therapy is not about not taking responsibility. I would almost say almost 99% of the patients that I've worked with, I think, I think I can say this, come out of therapy much more responsible as individuals than they were going into therapy. Now, Jerry, from the patient's perspective, mm -hmm. what would be the experience like? What would be the difference between coming once a week, for example, coming three times a week? What, what does it do? Oh, it's an enormous difference. If a person comes three times a week with a fair amount of consistency, they suddenly internalize that quiet space where they're allowed to talk and hear what they're saying. Okay? And that is healing for us human beings. It is very healing. It also allows the therapy not to focus just on immediate problems. I had, and one has to have, one has to give oneself a little breathing room to, to really hear what you're saying. Okay. Prim that's primarily on the patient side. It's also easier for the analyst, okay? because we're trained to hear on a lot of different levels, not just to respond to the immediate of symptom alleviation. That, the patient has to know that internally. We have to confirm emotional truth, okay? And if any therapy, any therapy, I believe it's worth its salt, has to allow you to come in to the therapist and say, I'm not getting any better, I'm not changing at all, what's going on? Yes. You have to be able to say that. And you have to be able to walk out of that one session or five sessions later or 10 sessions later with some sense of an internally satisfied no, roadmap. That's really hard to tell, for example, when you treat people with trauma. Yes, I know. Because yeah. I always try to prepare my patients and it's going to get worse before it's going to get yes, better. Yes, it will be, yes. Because yes. when you revisit a trauma, there's no way for you not to be in pain That's in right. the present. It's That's as right. if this trauma That's right. happened now. That's right. So, but the healing power of therapy is that you're going with somebody else. Mm -hmm. That maybe in the past, in your childhood, you went through this alone and you were confused about your feelings, you were not sure what, that, what you're experiencing is real, you were not sure if you have the right to experience what you experience, right. and you're alone. That's right. In therapy, you're not. You're not alone. You're not alone, and you're going through this step by step with somebody who with cares someone. about you, about you try to underst understand you, and who most of all validates your feeling, and that's the healing power. That's right. what I'm trying, and it will be painful. And it will Therapy be, but is not always fun. No, no, it isn't fun. But when we suddenly start <clears throat> digging up a lot of things that we've preferred not to look at in our lives, we may feel temporarily worse. What does worse mean? More anxious, more depressed. That's okay. Okay, it's like cutting up a boil. You have to cut open a boil to let it come out. Okay, so. That being the case, it's fine that there are, if you feel uh, uh, depressed or overly anxious or whatever. You have to discuss that with your therapist and ultimately at the end of one session or five sessions, you have to be satisfied 
that that is a necessary turn in the road, so to speak, of therapy, not necessarily an end. But if it is an end, and if you really are not accomplishing anything, and if after discussing it with your therapist, you still are deeply unsatisfied with any kind of answer, and you're trying to be as honest as you can, if that's the case, then you should leave and try to find somebody else. Okay? It's not magic. Okay? So it doesn't have the neutrality of getting antibiotics. Okay? It's a very personal, human interaction. The therapist has to have had his own pain that he's not denying in order to hear you. Simultaneously, the therapy, therapist has to be self-forgetful. Okay? But we have to listen with our souls, not just our minds. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is the transforming power of therapy? What's happening in therapy on the relationship with the therapist that makes us change? Ultimately, what is love? Love is willing the other person good, willing the other person well. Reich used to say, I don't necessarily care for my patients or like them in the beginning, but there's something wrong if I don't like them at the end. Okay. Okay. Meaning that, that you, this, is an, this is also an emotional exchange. It's got to be informed. It's got to be informed by what we call technique, by knowledge. Of course, I'm not questioning that. But a, a human being has to feel that you are genuinely interested in them. And if you're not, you really should be in another field. Many patients come to me and they are what, what we call fragmented. They have bits and pieces of memory of their childhood that cannot make sense of, that doesn't gel together to a coherent life story. And they're very confused. They have, I don't remember anything. People t tell me, I don't remember anything from my childhood, which is rarely the case. I usually say, you probably remember something, but it doesn't. So often I feel that what we do in therapy, we help the patient write their own autobi autobiography. That's correct. In a meaningful way. That's not right. Not just a fragmented right. way. There's a great uh, philosopher, Paul Ricoeur, a French philosopher, wrote a lot on psychoanalysis. And he says, in a sense, we, we don't give our patient new memories. We enable them to find other memories that have been pushed to the side. And that helps balance their appreciation of the past and their appreciation of themselves. Yes. We put the pieces of the puzzles Put together the pieces together. Their yes. Story, yes. The story yes. Of their yes. Life. Yes, and if there aren't too many happy experiences, and if it was primarily traumatic, then we help them mourn. And mourning is an essential part of life. And until we mourn, a lot of times, we can't let go of the past. So many people, the, the, the common uh, instinct is, let me get away with the, from the pain. I don't want to revisit it, I want to move on. And what you're saying now is exactly the opposite, that in order to survive, the loss of the morning, you have to revisit it. That's right. What is this? What, what does that do for you, the mourner? The morning helps you make it your own, rather than something just happening to you. Eric Erickson has a wonderful phrase, and I use it, I think, in Broken Fathers, Broken Sons, but if not, I must use it in my first book, mm -hmm. Psyche, Self, and Soul, where he says that the one of the goals of life, one of the goals of therapy, and this is really profound, I want people to think about it, is to be able to will the inevitable that happened to you. To be, not to keep fighting it, to understand the inevitability of life. That given my grandmother, given my mother's childhood, given my father, I have to say, of course, that's what happened. Okay? That doesn't mean I'm applauding it, it means I understand it. And if I keep fighting it as if it wasn't supposed to be, I'm wasting an enormous amount of psychic energy. Yeah? Sometimes it's very painful. I'm, I am still mourning the death of my beautiful wife, Julia, a, a year ago, a little, a little bit past a year. And it's almost unbearable at times. But we have to bear it. We have no choice but to bear it. And then you find out that you <coughs> there is a quiet place inside where the person is always with you, but that you have to go on life knowing that they're not outside of you, they're inside of you. Okay? And that just takes a certain amount of time. 
and a fair amount of pain, and that's perfectly okay. What I think what you're saying, what I'm saying, and I, I'm not knocking, I love my country, I love my culture, but we're, we're developing a level of speed and interaction that is not allowing us to understand that we do have a quiet space inside. How can we possibly know what the word spiritual means? Spiritual means that I have found a quiet place inside, okay? That is like sacred to me, which I go back and visit and, and gain my strength from. You know, when, uh, Jerry, when we talked before about what, uh, what is transforming in therapy, I, it, what comes to my mind is a lot of my patients who have been feeling feelings for a long, long time, but always either felt bad about them, about feeling hate, uh, sexual uh, anger, uh, resentment. Uh, they feel that something is wrong with them or that something is, is, is broken in them if they have these type of feelings. So often I find myself not doing much except validating it and normalizing it, that it makes sense and that it has a reason why. Or, uh, and that by itself sometimes I find that my patients being helped by just, not by changing their feeling, but giving them self permission to own feelings that they always had. Exactly right. I, I love the quote from the great Roman uh, playwright and poet Terence, who said, I count nothing human as alien to me. And that we have to understand that, that <clears throat> even if I morally have a position on a given issue, okay, I have to be able to understand, that doesn't mean I approve, but I have to be able to understand where a person might be coming from to do that. Otherwise, I'm going to be condemning parts of myself, okay? parts of myself. So that therapy doesn't say anything goes, it says everything is human. There's a big difference. Okay? Uh, too frequently, sometimes it's frequently presented as if therapy says everything is okay. No, you still have ethical choices. In fact, I believe you have more ethical capacity at the end of analysis than you have at the beginning because you know yourself better and you can make better ethical choices. They won't be so controlled by the past. Okay? But one may make more ethical choices, but you make it with a wider framework, a wider picture where I don't have to disown part of myself. You know, there's the, the idea that, that kind of, a little bit jargon, but that it's a real relationship, relationship not just a transferential relationship. Yes. That there's some relationship going on between the therapist and the patient that, are, that is real. Absolutely. That is happening, and not yeah. just because, you know, I'm care you experience me as caring because your mother was caring, you experience me no, as no, no, it has angry to be real. because your mother was no, no, angry. No, no, it has to be real. It has to be, it has to be, profe we're professional friends with our patients. We're not personal friends. That's the difference. We're professional friends, okay? It's an absolutely real relationship, but it's, it has certain parameters. Yeah. That brings me to the last question. Analysis psychoanalysis is being attacked today, really yes. attacked, as if it's archaic, right. they don't know what they're doing, it's taking right. too long, right. um, it's not scientific, the, it, there's no results, it's more for the therapist than for the patient. Why, if it's so good, then why are we attacked so badly? Well, first <laughs> of all, there have been a number of studies in the last three or four years that have showed that, uh, first of all, there is no dichotomy between taking medication and going to therapy that actually they both work very, very well together. Secondly, that long-term therapy is still the studies I have read, and you'll see some of the studies on the, on the uh, website of the American Psychoanalytic. Established Shadler, Jonathan Shadler. Yes, the long-term studies have proved the effectiveness of long-term therapy. Okay. Now you understand, probably, and I don't mean to sound angry here, but I'm, I am angry. Okay. With the most whom? powerful organizations in America are the insurance companies and the banks, and then their subsidiaries on Wall Street. Insurance companies make enormous amounts of money. I am not against anybody making enormous amounts of money. I'm not. I'm only against it when they use that position to start telling clinicians what they can do, what they can't do, and what they're supposed to do. Okay? Is any treatment open to abuse? Of course it is. Of course any treatment is open to abuse. But to say that your person can't come more than 10 sessions or 20 sessions a year is preposterous. 
is saying you only can take one antibiotic, and if it doesn't work too bad, you've got to wait three months, hope you don't die in between, before we'll allow you to take another antibiotic. Okay? So that there is, on that, on the structural side, more serious, though, we are now living in a society where we are so bombarded constantly with stimuli, morning, our cell phones, our TVs, our radios, our, our, our phones that we look at and get our emails on, okay? Uh, the, the, these high sophisticated music we hear in our cars and everything else. We are in a society that doesn't really seem to value much a quiet internal space. And the, the notion of taking time out and maybe somewhat prolonged time to find out who we are is almost a puzzlement to a lot of people. They don't understand it. And I think it has slowly changed our consciousness so that therapy does seem like something very odd. Well, why would you want to just talk about yourself? What are you doing? How are you getting anything done? Okay? How fast can therapy go? You know, my BMW does, you know, one to, one to 60 in about a mm, minute and a half. Okay? So how fast can I get it done? And sometimes therapists inadvertently feed into that with like in TED sessions, I will help you do whatever. That's usually not possible, okay? Because it disrespects our humanity.